How do I get the chat up? Uh, it's just a little, uh, the little oh, icon there. on the bottom okay, there we go. right yeah. uh, hand corner. Yeah. Yeah. While we're waiting, if people want to say hello on the chat and you know tell me where you're coming from, so I can kind of see who is. Oh, I, I recognize some familiar names here. I believe in Germany. Ooh. Excellent. Croatia, oh, my Mexico, goodness, Greece. Italy, Greece, yeah, yeah. New wow. York. This is you uh, I didn't realize that um ideas getting quite such an international reach. Um hello to all of you. It's amazing. Oh my goodness, Poland. Wow, hello, Brazil. Um excellent. <laughs> you are everywhere. You are Legion, yes. Uh this is amazing <laughs> stuff. Um yeah. Hopefully this is going to be a mix of, uh, you know, people who are not yet part of the Idea Academy family and maybe some existing students who want to learn a little bit more about career stuff. Um, oh my goodness, where else have we got? More Italians, uh, we've got Chile. Oh, the exotic St. Louis, excellent. Hello, hello. <laughs> Wonderful. I don't, yeah, uh, do you, uh, Paolo, do you have an idea of like how many people are coming so we'll know to... It's really, really difficult to say uh, for sure. Uh, so I think you just get started and, uh, you know, it, it's going to be recorded anyway. So uh, okay. it's not because uh, it's it's impossible. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that some people will come in a 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Some more people will arrive. So it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, there's no point just in waiting for everybody to be here at the same time. All right, fair enough. Um, so yeah, we'll get started and, and people can sort of catch the recording as needed. Um, oh, Algeria, I've, oh, goodness, I've, uh, and uh, a lovely Thai person here. This is uh, quite an international crew we have. Um, all right, so let's, oh, and Ukrainian, Slava. Um, okay, so well, uh, uh, good morning from uh, sunny California here. Um, I guess since we're an international group, um, we're going to be in all kinds of time zones. So wherever you are, good uh, evening or or afternoon to you all. Um, my name is Jim Moore, um, and I want to thank you all for coming. And I wanted to, to thank um, Idea Academy for having uh, me kind of do this talk. Um, so yeah. So, uh, so here's how it's going to go. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about careers in art, uh, entertainment art specifically, and just trying to sort of, I guess, cover uh, the basics of all the ways you can kind of make money and have a career using art as, as a basis. Um, this list isn't going to be uh, necessarily uh, comprehensive. I, I'm sure I'm missing uh, several different, different disciplines. I'm trying to keep it a little more focused to the types of things that are typically taught in um, uh, an art school like uh, Idea Academy. But there's a whole, you know, there's whole categories like animation, which is its own big thing, which I kind of, uh, I could do a talk on that just alone for uh, an animation school. But we'll kind of keep it grounded here. But um, after, after the main talk, we're going to do an AMA. So if you've got questions, I guess, the way we're going to do this is um, you can sort of put it in the chat and then I guess Paolo's going to kind of keep track of them and then at the end I'll, I'll sort of go through the backlog of questions. Um, so you know if you've got specific questions about any any kind of uh, you know career path that you that you had in mind you know I, I've done a lot of things in in my time uh, in, in the industry and so I should be able to at least point you in, in some kind of direction. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, so uh, with that said, let's sort of get into a little bit of uh, this stuff. So, um, all right, let me see here. Um, so my name is Jim Moore. I am a um, artist uh, for the last uh, 20 years somehow. I've been uh, creating art in the entertainment industry for the last 20 years and no one has kick me out of the industry uh, yet. So that's amazing and, and a sort of a good sign. Um, I, uh, let me just pull up a quick 
graphic here. Um, so I uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I started in the industry um, doing games. I started as a texture artist and I worked on some Star Wars games. Um, and I, I did that for about eight years. And then I started freelancing, at which time I worked on like kind of a little bit of everything. Um, and then in about 2012, I, uh, I got hired on by Lucasfilm to work on the Clone Wars. And then I, at that point, I started transitioning into animation and I worked on like Star Wars Resistance and Bad Batch. Uh, and now currently um, I am uh, co-directing a new series for Disney Plus, which uh, will be released um, next year in the fall, I think. So, you know, that's a quick uh, sort of brief summary on my work. And again, if you've got any questions about projects, we can sort of save that till the end. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Uh, we are here to talk about kittens. So, um, basically, this was me many years ago. Um, so, essentially, uh, when I got done with high school and I was trying to figure out what to do with myself, um, I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do. Um, at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of resources to kind of tell you, oh, here's all the kinds of things you can do with art. Um, so I had no clue. Uh, so, you know, even, even the art schools at the time, like art schools were always, or oftentimes, at least back then, are kind of 20 years behind the time. So, like, they kind of had no idea what to tell students um and honestly like it's embarrassing to say but like even though you know i've seen movies all my life i've watched animation i've played games it never occurred to me that like human beings actually were responsible for that kind of stuff it, it just this, this sort of disconnect or if there were human beings uh that did this kind of stuff basically i wasn't allowed to be you know like you, you kind of be like oh those those are sort of magical people that that are special and um that's not sort of a career path that I could take. So I, I really wasn't thinking in that mode until much later. And I, I suspect, even though there's a lot more resources for you guys out there these days, that some of you may be in the same boat. So some of you may be, you know, sort of recently graduated from high school or your equivalent, and you're trying to figure out, all right, uh, what am I gonna do? Should I go to art school? Is it worth it? Should I just take online classes? Um, should I, you know, go to conventions, this kind of stuff, you know, I've got to convince my parents to, you know, help me pay for this kind of stuff. What do I tell them? So like that is a, I, I definitely remember, uh, you know, what that situation was like. Um, and maybe some of you are actually already uh, in art school. Maybe some of you are, are hopefully uh, with Idea Academy already. Um, and that is another particular difficult situation because uh, I know what that's like. It's like, well, I've got to learn figure drawing and I've got to learn perspective and I've got to learn, uh, you know, these programs. I've got to learn Maya and Photoshop and I've got to learn value. And then I've got to paint this vase with a shoe in it and like all of these kinds of things. And like, and like the clock behind you is going doo -doo 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 -doo, as your hours uh, and, and days uh, and, and your life is draining away. And, you know, who has time to think about, um, careers and, and that, all, all that kind of thing, because all your brain power is basically trying to figure out how to be a good artist. So that's I was at least. Um, and so at some point people start talking about careers and graduation and you're like, huh, I guess I should start thinking about that. So yes, so this, this talk is for folks like you as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, some of you might have already been through all of this and you're sort of working right now. Maybe you've got a job and you're wanting to reboot your, your career a little bit. Uh, maybe you're, you're sort of in between, you know, you're, you're interviewing, you're applying to places, you're getting feedback, but maybe the feedback you're getting is, is kind of like a little bit wishy-washy or they're, they're wanting to see more or they're wanting to see more focus. Um, and so once again, uh, hopefully I can sort of help you to maybe get a direction. Um, and so for all of us kittens here, I made a little chart. This, um, and so this is going to sort of be the heart of our talk here today. And the main thing here is I've broken down uh, sort of, you know, the most common sorts of uh, categories up on this this first uh, sort of column here. Um, 
And then underneath that, I, I've sort of broken down the, the specific sorts of jobs that you'll be able to do. But the, the part that you should pay extra attention to is this blue area here. Because I've tried to sort of basically give you an idea of the sort of temperament or mindset that kind of comes along with this category. So when we get to this part, you should be thinking along the lines of, all right, does this describe me? And is this, does this sound good to me? And if it does, and maybe all of the things in this blue area sound good to you or describe the kinds of things that are appealing to you, then maybe this is a category that you should sort of pay attention to. Does that make sense? Um, and so as we go through these, um, I'll, I'll sort of give you examples because uh, some of these you will know for sure. You'll be like, okay, I know this. But then uh, some of them you won't know. Uh, some of these uh, you'll think you'll know, and I'll maybe give you some examples that you hadn't quite thought of because there's that's one of the takeaways I want to give you guys here is there's like a lot of different little areas within these fields um, that you may not know about and that maybe a lot of people don't know about. Um, and it may be a way for you to sort of sneak in where um, there's maybe a little bit less competition because that's the that's the problem here. Um, Sort of uh, entertainment art is a like billions of dollars industry. I think last I heard, and this is a while ago, I think games alone is like a ten billion dollar in industry. Um, like that's a lot of money. Like how many of us are there? There's forty of us. Like if we split that, like that's you know we could do pretty well amongst ourselves. The problem is it's not just us. It's like thousands of other people. Uh, you know, hundreds of other art schools are putting out thousands of other students and we're all competing for the same jobs. And so having a little bit more focus, I think, is is going to help you guys maybe, you know, maybe figure out where you want to be. And if you can kind of figure out that faster, um, that maybe will help to get you on the right path. Um, and And the other sort of, I guess, ongoing theme in this talk that I want to give you is that... Um, there's no such thing as like this straight path of like, here's where I am and here's where I want to go and we're going to make a straight line and it's going to be all great. Uh, because like myself, I kind of took this weird crooked line to get to where I am now. And um, that is actually kind of common and I'm going to give you some examples of people who were in the same situation. Um, so I, I wouldn't super stress about finding the exact, the exact place for you in the industry right away. It's more about... Um, I guess, I guess getting yourself started, exposing yourself to um, sort of new, uh, you know, new experiences, new workplaces, new uh, workflows, that kind of thing, uh, and then sort of using that to kind of find your way around um, the the industry. Uh, and hopefully that made some kind of sense. Um, holy, Paolo is is correcting me right now. In 2021, video games alone was 145 billion dollars in revenue. There's 42 of us. If uh, I don't know, if someone do the math. Like, how many billion is that for each of us? That's got to be what's that? Like, uh, you know, four, you know, make three point something. Like, that's that's not a bad haul for us. I, I think if we split this up, even yeah, that's not yeah. I'll take that. I'll take that. Unfortunately, we've got to share with other people. So I, you know, I want to get you started on that um, as as quickly as possible. Um, all right. So let's let's start with the one that you might be most familiar with here, uh, illustration art. So, um, in my opinion, uh, someone who is going to be in illustration art is going to be um, someone who's somewhat detail-oriented because, uh, you know, illustrations are going to be the final sort of actual used art that, however it's going to be used, whether it's marketing, book illustration, covers, so it's the final product, unlike some of this other stuff, which is more uh, pre-production it's it's the public will never see a lot of the stuff that we do a lot of stuff that i've done is only it only exists in my portfolio or on art station or something like that um you know someone playing a game or watching one of the uh, projects that i've worked on would never see my actual art uh and so for that reason for since illustration art is like an end product you're gonna, you know, a person in this industry is going to want to love doing like little details, like the little eye shine on the eyeball, the little eyelashes, if that, you know, if the art style calls for it. Um, you're gonna have longer deadlines. So that's gonna suit people who like to take their time, 
they like to think about uh, what they're doing and, and maybe try out a lot of different ideas and kind of, you know, take a coffee break, come back and look at it and go, okay, okay, I like this. Um, as opposed to there's a lot more um, faster turnaround kind of uh, uh, categories that where you're sort of just working and not thinking at all and, and going as crazy as you can. So something to consider. Um, but because it's a longer deadline uh, type of discipline, you're going to be subject to greater scrutiny. You're, you know, you're going to have an art director or an assistant art director or lead, and then you'll have like production people above them a lot of times, editors, all of this kind of stuff. And you're going to have a whole stack of people sort of looking at your work and um, sort of uh, nitpicking basically at every little thing like, oh, the shoe lice is off. Can we fix that? Um, so that's the kind of thing that can kind of annoy me, but I've learned like over 20 years to kind of like live with it. Um, but early on, like it drove me crazy. And so that's something to consider uh, for you. Like if if this endless sort of talking about, oh, can we can we move this? Uh, let's let's move this one pixel over and, and that kind of stuff, you know, something to consider uh, if you're going to go into illustration. Um, you do have more ownership on illustration. Uh, generally, it's going to be just you uh, as opposed to other disciplines are going to be more part more part of a pipeline. You're going to be doing more collaboration. So if you like to just, you know, put your headphones on, crank up the music and just start drawing away and kind of forget about the world, you know, maybe that's, you know, illustration is the way to go for you. Um, and I just threw in there using reference because um, the price of highly detailed, highly, you know, sort of dense kind of images is that you're going to want to make it believable in a lot of cases. Um, so a lot of times, and depending on the art style, of course, um, there's simpler illustration types and, and more complex ones. But a lot of times you're going to be doing re reference, uh, you might, which might include, you know, uh, getting your friend to pose, uh, you know, for you in, in a costume or something like that, or, or doing reference of, you know, going out in the street and, and sketching people to get good poses you know, finding props, all of this kind of stuff, uh, lighting reference, all of this, this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so some typical things might be, you know, sort of book illustration. And, you know, I, I know a lot of students um, at IDEA are, are into children's book uh, illustration. Um, in particular, a really cool field to get into. Um, I never really could quite break into that, uh, but um, that, is, that is great things. And, you know, if you see the students um, in IDEA, like we've got some amazing uh, kids book illustrators like right off the bat. Um, so that is, you know, a great area to get into. Um, but so, you know, so here's my first um, example here. So you know about book illustrations, you know about children's book illustrations. So these are the things you might uh, think, oh, okay, well, I'll apply for that. Uh, but those markets are flooded. So once again, you're, you're competing with, you know, thousands and thousands of other people. Um, and that's why I wanted to sort of uh, introduce you to a former student of mine, um, Jean-Paul Medellin, who uh, is um, a student of mine from uh, a workshop that I did in, uh, in the Czech Republic. And um, I've kept, I, I keep in touch with a lot of my students over the years. And, you know, one day he's, you know, he's been, he was working at it for a long time. He's a super hard worker but he wasn't getting bites. And then one day he's like, Jim, I finally got hired. And I'm like, oh, amazing. Tell me all about it. And he had this really, really interesting story. Um, so this was his art style at the time. And he, and um, well, I'll, I'll sort of read you sort of his words as he told it to me, because I, I said, um, I'm doing this, this talk and I, I want to hear your story. So this is from Jean-Paul. He says, uh, I, so this, he got a job in uh, textbook illustration. And I said, textbook illustration, how in the world did that happen? So he says, I stumbled on that job while I was looking at how to get representation as an illustrator. As you know, getting representation as an illustrator is very hard. And yeah, I got a lot of rejection emails to prove it. But then I started to think on another approach. Instead of looking for illustration agencies, what if I contacted the publisher directly? So I started to write to publishers, not only publishers that made fairy tales, novels, tales for kids, but I also contacted publishers that made educational books for children. And I know that those publishers use a lot of photos and illustration from Photosocks, but they also create specific images for different projects. So I prepared a portfolio with some images of what I could do. 
And one publisher wrote me back. They liked my style, but they wanted to know if I could match the style they had. So they sent me a quick test. I sent mine, and they're pretty happy about that. And as they say, the rest is history. And the most important thing about my work is that I needed to match the style that they threw at me. And so far, I think I've made illustrations using six or seven different styles. And at first, the images look quite easy, and you would say, oh, yeah, piece of cake. But then you start to make them, and you realize that each style has its own language and its own way to communicate something. And it also helps you to really think about the shape of things and how to simplify something uh, to get the best interpretation of it. Um, so yes, um, that uh, and that was amazing to me um, because that is something I never, you know, we all look at textbooks when we're in school and you see illustrations, you're like, oh, okay. I'd never thought that some, you know, this would be a sort of uh, career path that you could take. And that's the thing is that a lot of people don't think that. Um, so a lot of you, I know um, Italy has a lot of uh, book fairs. Uh, there's uh, the Bologna book fair and, and probably, you know, you guys could probably name a lot more. And the publishers are there and they're looking at portfolios and I would be willing to bet that, you know, the graphic novel companies and the children book companies, those are the ones that are, you know, getting all the, the portfolios and getting just drowned in portfolios. Probably textbook companies um, a little bit less. And so if you sort of look at this, you know, art style, you know, it, it's a simpler, cleaner, more graphic art style, which actually has first, but doing this um, allowed him to have a lot of work at one time. Um, and it um, gave him some stability and it gave him time to work on other things in his portfolio. Um, and as a result, he is now working on a feature animated film um, uh, from a production company in the Czech Republic. So this was kind of his bridge to sort of um, get to where he wanted to be, uh, which is absolutely, um, you know, the right approach for him and I think potentially uh, the right approach for you. Oh, and Alice is telling us, um, oh yes, the Bologna Children's Fair, um, Piu Libri, Piu Libri, <laughs> Libri, Liberi, and others. Uh, awesome, yeah, please, If actually, this is great. Thank you, Alice. Um, if you know, you guys are all over the world, and for those illustrated uh, illustrators who you know are know of uh, sort of uh, publishing fairs, list them because maybe there's someone else in your area of the world, and maybe they don't necessarily know about it. So all of you, you know, uh, definitely just let's let's educate each other and me too, um, I, I, because I, I'm learning about all of this stuff. So yeah, if you if you know any uh, other publishing fairs, that is great. Um, so yes. So that's Jean-Paul, and I'm very proud of him. Uh, he's a great guy. It's amazing. He came from Mexico, uh, went to the Czech Republic, learned Czech somehow, and like, and then in the lockdown, he had to move back to Mexico, but he was applying to all these uh, Czech positions, and the companies were like, uh, you know, <laughs> they were very confused, but he was like, no, no, I'm going to move back to Prague. It's going to be fine. So it, it um, all worked out uh, very well. Um, so yeah, so that is my little sort of side sort of uh, trip into book illustrations that you might not have thought about. Um, and so, so moving on, so key art, um, that might be something that you are uh, familiar with, but maybe didn't quite have the right word for. And, and that's the other thing here is just telling you what kind of the, the typical language is so that you can better describe to people what you're kind of doing. So key art is, and it's weird. So like all of these I've made it into nice little categories, but in some ways it's, it, there's a lot of crossover too. Cause like <clears throat> key art relies on like viz dev art. So that kind of ties into that a little bit. So it, it kind of crosses over into here a bit and as does marketing art and marketing art can sometimes become key art. Uh, and and vice versa, so we should kind of do that just to make things extra confusing. Um, but so, what is key art? Uh, key art is basically um, in in whether it's a game, a movie, uh, animation. It's basically a, um, it's sort of showing a moment, you know, from the project, basically. Um, so you know, it's not quite concept art, although you will need to utilize concept art. Um, and it's not quite marketing art, although there's there can be crossovers, and it's somewhat illustration, but it's sort of mixing all these things together. And so here's here's two examples. So one of these is marketing art, and one of these is key art. And the way you can tell is 
tea art is a moment from the movie, um, or or at least at one point they thought it was going to be a moment from the movie. So this is this would be more in the key art range. This is uh, you know like an actual you know if like a frame from the film basically. Um, in contrast, this is marketing art, which uh, like takes us to that category. Um, so when I talked about like a lot of people looking at your work and approving it, like marketing art is that times 10 because, you know, going up through your art director and then the production designer and maybe the executive director and then the marketing team, and then there may be a license holder and they've got to make sure that, you know, like if, if you're doing this and, you know, whoever, you know, like is in charge of the, uh, you know, the, the franchise of, Captain America, let's say, he's going to want to make sure that you've got the chin strap right and you've got the belt buckle right and all this stuff. And so, there, and but someone else is going to be worried about how you've drawn the Hulk and, and all this kind of stuff. So, um, and this is something I've dealt with a lot with Star Wars. Um, so, my God, <laughs> just sort of brace yourself for a lot of comments. Um, but yeah, so you can see the, this is, you know, marketing art is a high level of, of polish. And the cool thing about that is the public actually gets to see this. This will be on a billboard, this will be on an ad, this will be in a magazine, all of that kind of stuff. The downside to marketing art is a lot of times you're dealing with people who are not artists, don't know anything about art, and have no taste. Um, I, I wanted to show you something that I only have recently learned about that. So if you know about this, good for you. Um, so you. So if you look at these faces, um, you'll notice something very uh, common to all of them. Um, and I just discovered what this is. This is called DreamWorks face. Um, and in fairness to, to DreamWorks, everyone does this. This is like, you'll see this in Pixar stuff. We've got Disney characters here also. So it's this weird, like, eyebrow up, smiling aggressively kind of emotion. I don't even, I don't even know that this is a human emotion. Like... What, what is this, like, um, skeptically happy or aggressively angry? I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what this is supposed to communicate, but at, <laughs> smug, maybe smug, uh, thank you. Yeah, smug, yeah, the other, um, someone else had a, another term for this, uh, smarm brow, it, because it is kind of smarmy. It's like, what, what are you thinking about? But <laughs> so at some point, marketing's like, yes, this is what people want to see. Um, people want to see like this emotion, whatever it is, on every character. It doesn't matter the personality of the character, like <laughs> yeah, being super cool kind of thing. Um, so yeah, but and then at some point that that film or whatever it was must have done well because then everyone started doing it, and like you you get this all across everything. And this is not something that an artist would think of themselves. So like to be clear here, I'm not. Try, I'm, I would never put down any artist or any production or anything like that. It's this is more about the kinds of things that marketing um, forces you to do against your will. And you know, if you go into marketing illustration, be prepared for this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it this was cracking me up the other. So I was so um, the other night I was pulling up images of all this stuff, and I was like, oh wow, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of DreamWorks face, and then. This, as far as I can tell, I've never seen Boss Baby, but apparently he's only got one expression, and that expression is to constantly look like he's coolly joyful and angry at the same time, and that's kind of all he does. Um, and no offense to any Boss Baby fans out there, I'm, I'm sure it's a fine show, but th their marketing department maybe needs to dial back on, on the sort of smug, cool guy look. Um, so yeah. <laughs> That is my uh, introduction to uh, marketing art. And I probably, if any of you were considering marketing art, you're not any longer. Um, and I'm sorry for that. But as you can see, um, you do get some, some cool images out of it. And if you can just avoid the sort of smart brow look, um, you're, you're gonna have a really cool portfolio of really sort of sexy images and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that is sort of the highlights of, of illustration here, I believe. All righty. I hope you guys are still with me because um, we're moving on to sequential art next here. All right. So once again, um, you know, in this blue area, if this describes you, 
sequential art may be the thing for you. So what do we have? Um, big picture oriented, because in sequential art, you're not just thinking, you know, uh, illustration art is very much like you're taking a moment in time, like one frame in time, and you're freezing time, and you're doing that one moment. Of course, sequential art is adding the dimension of time here. So you've got to keep in mind the big picture. You're, you know, if you have two people in a scene, you need to make sure that obviously the two people look the same from scene to scene. Everything's consistent. The scene itself needs to be consistent. If you're flipping cameras, if you've got a reverse shot, if you're doing all of the stuff, everything needs to be consistent. Otherwise, your audience is going to get very confused. So, yeah. Um, so that's a big one. Uh, rapid iteration. A lot of times um, in sequential art, you're going to be needing to move fast. You're going to need to put out a, a pencil sketch really quick so that the rest of the pipeline can kind of see it, make sure it works for them, and then it comes back to you, and then you're ready to work. Or you get changes, and you got to kind of go through the whole process again. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, cinematic mindset. Um, you're definitely going to be thinking about cameras. Um, you're going to be thinking about angles. You may be, you know, if you're working in film or animation, you may be thinking as, as advanced as actually what lens you're going to, you know, use. You, you want a sort of a, a wide lens to get like a, you know, a narrow depth of focus, you know, like depth of field stuff, just like a, a lot of things like that, which borderline sort of are going to be more technical. Um, re repetitive tasks. Um, one thing about sequential art is, you know, you're going to be drawing like, the same face over and over again. So consist consistency is going to be key. And more team interaction, too. Um, a lot of times, um, your sequential art that you're doing, whether it's a storyboard or you know panels of a comic, are going to be handed to someone else. Um, and uh, so you're going to be interacting with a lot of other people, sort of upstream and downstream from you. Um, and, it, and this is in addition to being a approved which is coming from overhead you're going to be dealing with you know someone that you might hand off some stuff to to color or someone might be handing stuff off to you to ink or something like that um so yeah so obviously um a lot of you are going to be familiar with comics and graphic novels um and um one thing that i will say that idea academy seems to specialize in is they get a lot of folks um doing um sort of uh color work uh, as they come out of school. Um, and uh, Enrica Angiolini was uh, actually, I think, in one of my first um, Idea Academy classes. And uh, and I don't even remember how uh, long ago that was, maybe like eight years or 10 years ago. Um, and um, she uh, has just blown us all away with her incredible work, um, starting with more indie comics. She might even be here. And Enrica, if you are here, feel free to shout and wave at us. Um, but, uh, you know, I keep in contact with her a lot and, you know, I, her Facebook page comes up and like, she's, she's got some new amazing project that she's working on. So, uh, you know, in not a lot of time she's working on, you know, the coloring, uh, you know, just the, the greatest titles, uh, at DC, I believe she's worked for image. Um, she's, she's worked for, uh, you know, most of the big names here and, and doing cover art as well. Oh, Paulo thinks 2016. So, wow. Time does fly. Um, so yes, um, and uh, she's not the only one. Um, she, uh, I can think of several of my students who go on to uh, do coloring for graphic novels um, and, and comics. And it's, it's a great sort of field that maybe you wouldn't necessarily think of, you know, in the, in the comic pipeline. Um, you know, you penciling, for a traditional sort of comic look, you know, you start penciling and inking, and then it gets passed off to a separate artist. And, um, you know, it's a great way to sort of uh, get your chops in order and, and strengthen your color theory while sort of um, being part of a, you know, a, a high profile project. And that's opened a lot of doors for her. And I am so uh, proud is not the, not the right word. I, I, I don't feel right being proud of my students because that implies that I had something to do with it. I, it's more like I'm witnessing their greatness manifest a little bit, which is really awesome. So I've, I feel really privileged to see my students go on to great things. So that is that is uh, some amazing stuff there. Um, let's see. Next, we've got. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, 
let's see, storyboards and animatics um, is another uh, big thing that um, this is work that you'll find in um, uh, a lot of animation, especially, but some feature film too. If, if we've got any sort of feature film guys there, like you want to work at ILM, you want to work at uh, you know, Marvel, anything like that, you know, a lot, especially action um, heavy um, sort of features, they're going to want storyboard artists, which are generally going to be in black and white. And sort of the parallel to that is color scripts, which I've brought up here because um, some of you may be less familiar with this. Um, this is one of those, uh, again, um, you know, a, a lot of people in art school, you know, there are the most popular things. It's like children's books, illustrations, you know, comics, uh, concept art is, is the main things. A lot of people aren't thinking in terms of, okay, what other jobs need to be done? Um, and here's one of those jobs. So color scripts are basically describing the flow of light and color throughout the, you know, the length of either the sequence or the entire project. And um, a lot of times it's there not to serve, well, it's two purposes. So one is just to sort of show, like on a very technical level, where is the light? Okay, what is your key light? What is the time of day? What are your source lights in the scene? How do we make that consistent from um, frame to frame? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but then secondly, there's an emotional component too, which, um, you know, you only really see when you zoom out. And that goes back to this part of sort of the big picture oriented part. So, uh, and, and especially you get to do this in feature um, length stuff. This is actually something I'm dealing with in um, my show that I'm doing right now. But, uh, you know, the show's kind of uh, an 11 minute back to back episode things. You have a lot less time to do this kind of stuff. But this is really cool when you can zoom out and you can kind of see, okay, we're even like I don't even know what the uh, content of this this these screens are, but I do know that we're starting with this very cool palette, so it's probably a very calm, relaxing scene. We're establishing like a nice, tranquil sort of uh, you know starting point here, and then we're starting to brighten things up. We're moving into an area of excitement and and all of this kind of stuff, and then you know we're we're sidelining back into the normal world and we're going into these new locations and. If you can react to these beats emotionally just from looking at these colored squares, the idea is once you take that to final light and animation, that emotion will translate to the final product and make it a more um, fulfilling and emotionally satisfying kind of uh, you know project there. Um, and so I've I've pulled um, shots here from some Disney uh, boards, you, and you know this will be familiar here. Um, good old Nemo. Um, and you can see um, so, some of these can be quite loose, um, you know, so it, like it, I, I think there's a, a good amount of, like spectrum of working super loose to super tight. Um, and so you can see sometimes, you know, you, you're getting to expressions and, you know, sometimes it, it can be quite abstract. Um, but yeah, the, that is um, something that I've only started doing recently and I, I really quite enjoy, honestly. Um, so yeah, if if this temperament seems like something that you're enjoying, um, you know, if, if this is is uh, describing you, you know, maybe these are some career paths you should think about. All right. So now, and then, yeah, also, so sequential art, especially color scripts and storyboards, they also rely on having set visual development. So, you know, you might be tangled up with character, environment, prob, you know, all of this stuff, as well as storyboards. And then you, the color scripts have to, the storyboards are done first so that then the color scripts know what shots you're using. So that's kind of going all over the place here. And, you know, this also kind of feeds into that a little bit as well. So you can see there's a lot of cross-pollination here, which is why it's easy to kind of figure out, um, you know, like if you find yourself in one of these categories and you're like, ooh, this looks interesting. It's actually not that hard to, to sort of transition yourself once you've established a little bit of a career. Um, yeah, so now we're getting into visual development, which is probably what a lot of you guys are here for or are thinking about the most. So VizDev. So, all right. Let's see if this describes you. It's kind of like a personality test in a way, you know, like instead of 
trying to figure out what Harry Potter house, you know, you belong to. It, it's like, we're, we're just trying to figure out what's, uh, you know, do we have any Gryffindor people here ha happening in visual development or something? It's, it's a little more productive. So that's, that's nice. Um, so visual development, let's see, problem solving. So we're kind of, so I've worked in visual development a lot. So I, I, um, I guess I relate to this a bit. So we're kind of the tip of the spear. We we get the mess first, and we've got to we we have this mess of ideas from writers or you know like a pitch project, and we've got to assemble everything and put it together in a way that makes sense. And I look at that as pro problem solving. So a lot of times you get like a um, description. You it's like oh okay we got a main character and he needs to be in his early twenties and he needs to be outrageously awesome but also sensitive and also this kind of stuff. And then we have to kind of all right, build a you know a character wardrobe, you know props, all of this kind of stuff. Um, so you know if you kind of think in this sort of analytical way and are able to come up with a lot of different options for solving one particular design problem, that is a very good, um, very good sort of a trait that might be good for VizDev. Um, rapid iteration, um, just like with sequential work, um, you're going to be doing a ton of sketches at first. You're going to be handing that off to someone to approve and talk about and maybe change and come back to a second version and a third version and all of this. So if that's appealing to you, you know, keep that in mind. More team interaction. Uh, because we are at the start of the project, uh, almost always, I mean, you know, we're part of the pre-production team. A lot of times stuff goes down the pipeline and then something happens at modeling or animation and it comes back to us. So we're having to um, deal with a lot of different departments. Um, a lot of times, you know, for games, uh, for example, you might be designing something and um, you've got like, you've got this character and they've got a million banners flying off of them and it gets to, it gets to the engineering department and they're like, nah, you can't have that. He, he, gets, uh, he gets a cape and that's it, you know, and then it's like, all right, well, let's, let's redraw this. Um, so, you know, a lot, there's, there's, it's very much a collaborative effort. Uh, is the point of that. Uh, so visual storytelling and world building. So this is kind of something that um, a lot of times if you're just focusing on um, the art part of it and less on the conceptual part, it may be a new, new sort of idea. Um, but this is basically the idea that you can tell a story by um, with visuals. So if you think of, um, you know, you're meeting someone for the first time and you kind of look them up and down and you, there's little kind of cues, the way they're dressed, the way they stand, the way they talk and use their hands and stuff like this, you know, you know, just the, the way they groom themselves, the way, um, you know, their accent, all of this stuff kind of feeds into basically um, telling the story of this person. And that's true of a prop. It's true of a location, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all, um, that's all part of visual storytelling. And then world building is just that on a, on a grander scale, you know, like, uh, oh, okay, we're designing this fantasy world. Um, this, we want to imply that there's this, uh, this is kingdom with like a lot of history behind it. How do you show that? You know, the, the wear and tear on these buildings, is it battle scarred from like a million battles over time, all of that kind of stuff. Um, oh, and I see. Annabelle has a, a great question. Let's flag that for the for the uh, um, AMA part because that's that's a you know kind of uh, what I talked about. But we can go even more into detail about that. Um, but yes, so you know, world building, um, visual storytelling. It's it's all kind of stuff that you should be thinking about as VizDev. Um, so then breaking this down, some of this um, you're going to be very familiar with uh, sort of character, you know, environment, prop creature and you know sort of this stems from writing but then you know this is the stuff that feeds illustration feeds storyboards all of that kind of stuff so kind of like everyone's relying on us <laughs> at this stage like to to have really nice concepts a lot of times this will uh, involve doing orthos um you know which is front back side you know call outs of, of various things so that everyone up and down the you know sort of the pipeline will know exactly you know, the idea we're trying to get across. Um, and a couple of things though, that maybe you hadn't realized about, uh, vis, you know, VizDev. Uh, there's a couple of paths that I kind of wanted to talk about here. Um, 
And so one is uh, costume design. And so these are some amazing costume designs from one of my favorite costume designers who unfortunately has uh, passed away in a, in a bit. And if some of you recognize the work here, uh, some of you, like if, if not the artist, um, we've got work from Dracula from 1990 something, uh, The Cell, um, I believe, Mirror Mirror or one of those Snow White movies, I forget exactly. And one of my favorite films, um, The Fall. Uh, and this is uh, Aiko, I, I will probably butcher this name, but Aiko Ishioka. So she was a, um, she was a Japanese um, costume designer who was just really an amazing um, person on scene who really, um, I don't know, I felt like took film costume design to another level during her time. And um, she's got an incredible story because uh, she, I think her parents started out as, um, or her parents were graphic designers, or, or one of her parents. And so she sort of got into that line and then she sort of started, uh, she got on at a cosmetic brand company. So she was doing like advertisements for makeup and stuff like this. Um, and then eventually she just kind of realized that like, oh, wait a second, I've got, you know, there's something more here. And so just as, you know, throughout the years, she did this for a long time and uh, she got uh, to take part in this uh, sort of makeup campaign, this Japanese company where they just sort of let her have free reign. And she did these amazing costumes for just the makeup, like amazingly, which doesn't make any sense, but it caught uh, a lot of international attention. Francis Ford Coppola saw it and he said, hey, let's, let's do a project together. And they did a project um, just as a promo. And then based on that, he was like, hey, do you want to be a costume designer? And she was like, sure, why not? And um, so um, once, yeah, so, you know, she's a great example I like to use of like someone starting somewhere, realizing, you know, maybe it's not exactly where I want to go and sort of coming, you know, into their, you know, finding their own space sort of in the world. Um, which I, I think in the end, everyone kind of has to do to, to some extent or, or another. Um, and, and that's important, I think, uh, for you guys. Um, when you're first starting out, your first job may not be the greatest fit for you. And I've seen people drop out because they become disillusioned with, you know, like a lot of people start in video games and it's this huge grind and it's just no fun after a while. And you're like, what am I doing? Maybe I needed to reconsider my career. and um, it's the right idea to reconsider, but sometimes it's just sort of finding the area for you. It's not that you need to give up on art entirely. It's just that you need to find where in art you belong, basically, if that makes sense. Um, so she's, she's a great example of that. And I've got uh, several more of, of that uh, as well. Um, and yeah, so, you know, similar thing with uh, set design, you know, live theater um, is, you know, with just manufacturing and tech these days, they're able to do a lot more interesting, intricate things uh, on live theater set designs. Um, and that's, you know, usually sort of theater major kind of, theater majors are the people who end up sort of doing set design, but you know, there's space in there for outsiders to come in. And if you've got a great presentation, you know, that is, that is the kind of thing you get into as well. Um, so yes, let me see. Uh, uh, uh. So at this point, I'm going to do you all a favor by giving you a break from my voice, and I'm going to bring on a special guest star with us, um, who uh, will is actually recently um, in the same position you were, and she's got an interesting journey that I wanted to share with you all, and it's continuing this um, theme of of you know finding your way sort of in in art, um, and if uh, Raquel is there with us. Um, I'd love to invite her on to to chat. Hello, guys. Oh, you're still awake. Excellent. Yes, Excellent. I, I am. I, I wonder about uh, <laughs> Well, you know, yeah. this, is, this can be quite boring, but um, I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, <laughs> hey, there she is. All right. Excellent. So Raquel um, uh, attended one of my kind of short workshops a, a few years ago, and that's how we know each other. And um, she has a very interesting art journey. So I just wanted to do a, a couple questions with her and she can kind of maybe serve as a little bit of inspiration for you guys. 
So, um, Rukele, let's see, where to start? Well, um, why don't you just sort of give us a quick, quick overview of your relationship with art? Like, have you always been an artist? You know, have you been drawing your whole life? Is this something that's more recent for you? Tell us, tell us about it. Tell us everything. I think I've always been drawing. You know, I, I can't remember a time when I was not actually just looking at TV shows and drawing, copying characters. I think everyone did when they were kids. Uh, but no, I didn't have a formal training in, in art until I was maybe 19, 20, when I enrolled in a comic school. But that, those were actually evening classes because I was studying medicine in university. You were studying and, medicine. So you were, you were, and you had this artistic sense your whole life. But in the end, instead of doing that, you decide to study medicine and and like uh, just I, I guess people can probably guess why but please tell us why you felt like that that was the correct decision at the time like what happened um i grew up in a small town in southern italy and as you said before i had no idea that you could actually work in animation maybe in comics yes because in italy we have a big, bigger comic industry but those people were like superheroes to me i had no idea how to get there I just kept drawing in my free time. I bought a comic, a drawing tablet. So I was just drawing because I enjoyed that. But when um, I finished high school, my my parents kind of encouraged me to, <laughs> to pursue a more stable career uh, in the medical field. So I, I just went on with that, but nothing could keep me away from the drawing table for too long. So I went back to drawing many different occasions. I, I love how you say in your spare time, because <laughs> that means you were in medical school studying and then you actually became a dottoressa, of course, right? Yes. So, but, so oh, you know, spare time, like, you know, <laughs> like in the one hour a day when you're not sort of in the emergency room or you know, doing all of this kind of stuff, you know, you're drawing. So. Uh, anyone out there that, that instantly makes the rest of us very lazy and we should be ashamed of ourselves. If you are a doctor by day, by day artist by night. Um, but okay, very good. Um, but then, so uh, so you never gave up the dream. But so I, I, you went to a proper university and I guess they did not have much of a of an art department, right? No, no, no. Okay. I don't, I think you can study like arts in... I don't know how to explain that, but in, in a more classical way in university, but we don't have programs in Italy for maybe concept art or these kind of things. Okay, excellent. And so then at some point you kind of decided to, to or how did you discover uh, IDEA actually? Oh, I kept seeing this amazing stuff, work from the students. Oh. And it was so interesting because many schools also abroad, they have like a four year course so you think okay i see how they can get there in four years but uh, idea academy has these short courses you you can take just master level one or do level one and level two and people were so good after the master and they said okay i i have to get there so i took one gap year after university and i said just let's give it a try i will take this one year and see if this makes the magic Wow. Okay. So at this point, now you're doctor by day, like student at night. So you're, you're taking these master classes for one year, sort of doing this kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I think, at, and so after one year, that's kind of when you contacted me, sort of at the end of that? Um, a few months after that, because. A few um, months after. Okay. Yes. Towards the end of, of the master, I started working in, in the hospital because, you know, I have to pay rent. <laughs> I have to do something uh, because I took a gap year and I just needed to do that. Uh, but I kept working on my portfolio uh, during my free time, which means weekends, <laughs> basically. Excellent. And then, right. yeah, that, then we met virtually again right. after a few months. And let me see if I can... Um... Hold on, I'm trying to move um, your artwork um, over. Uh, 
So, and so when you came to me, you had a portfolio. Let's see. And which was was quite good. Um, so this is some of the stuff that um, you asked me. You contacted me over LinkedIn. You were like, "Oh, hey, we we had this uh, classic." And you can see this the screen with your work, right? I'm showing that. Okay. So um, and I looked at this and I said, "Wow, this is actually amazing stuff." Like I'm so impressed with this kind of stuff. And I'm seeing this these frames here. And I'm seeing this sort of story moment, kind of sort of a story, storyboard, but not quite. Um, and at this point, um, did you have an idea of what you wanted to, to do? Not really. I enjoyed okay. many things in pre-production, in visual development, uh, okay. but no. I Maybe on some level, I still don't know, but I'm starting to figure that out. Okay. Well, and that's good. I mean, that, if anything, that is what this talk is, is trying to get. If you take one message from my long, long rambling sort of speech here, it's that like we all have to figure it out, but there is a path and there's a path for everyone and there's a way to do it. You just have to figure it out. Um, and which, which I'm happy to say that things are, are going good because we're looking at this and I'm seeing this and I'm like, wait a second, there's a couple of interesting jobs here that that maybe you would be very good at and and the reason i'm showing this stuff is like okay your your color is great your stylization is great and you're doing um sequential stuff so like in my brain okay you're a color script artist and so i told you about this and so tell me what did you know about color uh, like sh surely you knew a little bit about color scripts before right oh yes like i have the art book from pixar <laughs> And that's okay, amazing, right. but yeah, that's pretty much all, all I knew about that. Right. Um, but you hadn't considered to do it yourself. And so we kind of talked a little bit and said, hey, what if you turned all of this into a color script? And that's what you did here. And I was like, um, this is amazing stuff. And, you know, we tweaked things a little bit here and there. And um, this was a, an incredible piece. Um, so then... You, I said, hey, why don't you put this up on LinkedIn? Because that's what people are doing these days and it gets a lot of nice reaction. So you put it on LinkedIn and then what happened next? Oh yes, I, I got some job offers actually. <laughs> and I took one. Now I am, I am not working with color yet, but it led me to where I am today. So I'm working in animation finally. <laughs> yes. And yes, I, I got, positive feedback uh, from different studios. So this was great. Uh, absolutely. And I want to mention here that you were getting positive feedback even before we talked. It's not like this was some magic <laughs> moment or anything. Um, I believe, was it Nickelodeon that was kind of in? You were having conversations with them? Yes. Earlier, right? But then, so like, if, if, you know, if you're comfortable naming the studios, you know, you, you got multiple interests from multiple art directors. Um, yes. And, um, and do, you, do you want to tell everyone who you're working for now? Yes, I am working for Giant Animation in Ireland. Uh, but actually, we are working for, for a big studio in the US. I don't know if I am allowed to say that, but <laughs> I think, you know, in a few months, you, you will know that. And I also got interest uh, from Robio. And now there is another studio. Maybe I can't tell about that yet, but you just know there's another one okay. there's a line <laughs> i'm joking <laughs> and the, the, and that is amazing this is this is my wish for everyone who's listening to here is that you know you find your your path in the world and maybe maybe it doesn't happen immediately but it kind of unlocks the next step for you and you kind of go aha this is the thing that i enjoy doing um and what kind of feedback were you getting when people reached out to you what what kind of stuff were they focused on? What did they love your color? Did they love your your framing, or you know, what did they talk about? They were generally really happy that I could do color and um, that my compositions work. They said that it's not really common to see that in portfolios, and also what they liked was to see variety in my work because 
I, I don't know if this, this is a good advice because different studios look for different things. But for me, uh, what happened is that to see variety, to see that I could do different things, uh, it was helpful to to get my current role. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, that's kind of one of these uh, age old questions of like, should I be a specialist and only do one thing or should I be a generalist and do a lot of different things? And that's one of those questions that kind of has no answer. It, it kind of it depends on what you want to do and like what your skill set is and, and all of that kind of thing. So it depends from person to person. But um, in your case, being a generalist kind of actually ended up helping um, and and sort of got you to where you are now. So that that is incredible stuff. Um, let me see. Okay, just moving my screen back okay there we go so yes um so that that is amazing stuff um and so do you feel like um no oh, geez all kinds of pop-ups here um so yeah like i don't know i i, I kind of I, I feel like people want to know do you feel like you know what's what's the next step for you like do you you know do you want to keep exploring do you feel like you you know exactly what you want to do at this point now, what's in um, what's in store for Raquel? <laughs> I, um, as I was saying before, color is not a part of my current job right now, but it might be in a few months. Who knows? Uh, but for sure, I want to 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 go on and explore that because I'd love to work with with color one day, maybe with color scripts. Um, <laughs> that, definitely, that could be a good choice. Yes, um, and just in case, since you're on camera with me right now, and you might be distracted. <laughs> You read the uh, the comments right now. We, you've just inspired uh, Joey Gens, who is a regretted architect, who's maybe thinking about rebooting his career. That's amazing. You get you've got a lot of lovely comments on your work, and it's incredible. And you deserve all of it. So that is that is incredible stuff. And thank you so much. I had to really do a lot of negotiation to get Raquel uh, to to talk here. She was not happy with me when I proposed this, this thing, but it was very nice for you to, to share your story with us. Um, thank you so much. And I, I, will, <laughs> I will let you off the hook now because uh, I know this is very painful for you, but thank you very much. So uh, everyone um, give, give Raquel a uh, great thanks. Um, right, it was great. Bye guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So, I mean, to me, what more inspiration um, could you have than that? And and like, there's there's a lot of students that I've worked with in the past who I could bring on. I, one of these days, I should just have like a lineup of all my past students, and and it'll be great. And I tell all of them the main reason I'm doing this is so that like when I, I'm old and they're art directors, that they will hire me. And so like I'm I'm holding everyone to that. So like this is in the end, this is just going to come back to me. So that's that's the real motivation that I've got here. Um, so yes, uh, so this is good stuff. And also like, you know, uh, I, I'm seeing, um, some of my current people that I'm working with, which is great to see. And so, uh, it'll, you know, when I, after a workshop, um, I invite everyone to contact me and, you know, if you've ever got any questions, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to look at your work and stuff. And, and when we do that, like I become, like I feel like I'm going through your journey with you. Like I'm I'm with you when you get your rejection letter. I'm like no no. And so and I've done it. I've done it a lot of times. And just like I by now I can kind of feel like um, I know when the light at the end of the tunnel is is coming. So like um, just trust me when I say that like you're not the first person to go through this. It's um, it, and you will get through it. So just I don't know. Take that for what it's worth. I guess. Um, but all right, so let's finish up our list here. Uh, how are we doing on time? We started at uh, 9.30, 10.30 now. Um, I'm keeping Paolo later than he thought. I, I think this was only originally scheduled for an hour. I'll try to wrap this up so that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get there one way or the other. It could take another 30 minutes. It could take several days. Um, who knows? We'll, we'll find out. Um, so let's see. Okay, so now we're moving on to 3D slash production art, which is kind of this big grouping that I didn't quite know how else to put together. So 
this doesn't uh, make a hundred percent sense, but um, maybe we'll we'll figure it all out. Um, all right, so 3D and production art. What kind of person would like to do that? Well, if you're technically oriented, that's good because you're going to be you're going to be dealing with like a Maya, ZBrush, you know, potentially uh, Blender. Uh, that's a big one that I uh, that I try to get everyone to use because it's free and it's kind of you know wave of the future and it's got a great uh, community around it. Um, problem solving is a huge one because uh, and, and this goes with R and D um, because a lot of times the thing you're trying to do um, hasn't been done yet, um, at least not in the way that you're doing it or on the type of project you're working on. So it's like, oh, I need to build this crazy character with like a hundred arms and like no one has a rig for that. So then you're going to have to figure out how to either fake it or come up with some weird technical solution working with the rigging department or something like that. So there's a lot of times when you're kind of trying to figure stuff out on the fly, which, you know, for some people is really fun and a great challenge. For other people, it's a nightmare. You know, who knows? <laughs> like, you're going to have to decide whether or not that sounds appealing to you. Um, and once again, you sort of, um, at the 3D end, you are the next step in the pipeline after visual development. So like 3D art in general kind of comes from there. And I know, to, I know some people who are great concept artists who then also will do their own models, which is great because once again, sort of as Raquel demonstrated, sometimes uh, some studios appreciate you doing several different kinds of things. So that's uh, those. So what's a, what types of actual jobs are here? So obviously, you know, CG modelers are great. Um, texture artists, which is what I started as, which is the most mind-numbing, horrific kind of thing, which is you sort of have a, you know, a, a model needs to have different colors and textures on it. And so you put that all on a, on a flat image and, uh, and you have to sort of paint that in 2D, but it's going to be in 3D and it's in UVs, my God. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that for anyone, but you know, if you if you are a person who likes a lot of pain and suffering, then you know maybe that is the career for you. Um, shader and look dev. Um, this is going to be in in mostly in like feature and uh, animation, and it's it's just um, defining what sh sort of shaders look like, so that when you're watching an animation or something, a rock will look like it's made out of rock material, like a, a metal band or something will look like it's made of brass or silver or something like that. So just developing actual shaders, um, matte painters, um, and so let's see, let me put this out there. So just putting on, just in case there's any um, kind of confusion, because a, a lot of times when you see um, stuff that's being called matte painting, it's actually kind of not quite, and I think that matte painters like to sometimes put in extra stuff to make their, their images more sexy. So the matte painting part of things is going to be anything you don't want to actually build in CG, you can kind of pre-do it very prettily and have it as sort of a background plate. And then the moving elements are um, their own thing. So in this case, you could not use this as a matte painting because all of these ships are meant to be moving around, right? So that wouldn't make sense if they were just frozen in sky. So what you would do is you would have the clean plate of this, which is just the city, maybe the clouds, because they're probably not moving that fast. And then over the top of that, you would have animated elements. Um, and these that, you know, it used to be back in the olden days, this would be done with like paint on a piece of glass. Um, and they, they would actually shoot the film over it. Um, in this case, uh, it's all digital. So it's uh, a lot of the times you are you are actually pre-building the stuff. It's just rendered nicely first, uh, and then put into the shot, um, you know, behind the moving elements to to sort of speed things up a little bit. This one's a, a little bit better because these ships, some of the ones in the background, they might be sort of sitting still, but like smoke would be an, an added effect. You know, uh, a lot of these faster moving ships would would need to be moved around, so you would clear all of that off for a background plate. Um, so yeah, that is like, and and once again, that kind of goes back into like some of this stuff. Like you would need to know what the, uh, you know, the environment looks like um, first before you can kind of matte painting, before you can matte paint it basically. So, you know, there's a lot of interaction that way. Sometimes, you know, a environmental artist might be the matte painter themselves if they have that skill set. 
Um, alrighty. So that is map painting. Then, um, so here's one that you might not have thought about. And this is really one of those things where it's like, okay, I love this stuff. Like, I don't know how I would ever get to this point, but um, working with physical, actual practical models, um, whether it's working at uh, ILM's um, sort of prop department um, or working on Leica's sort of stop mo sets. And like, just between you and me, like I would accept any amount of money to sort of come and work for Leica and sew tiny pants for all the like, man, like that's for me, that's that would be the end goal for other people. That would be torture, but like, you know, that's, that's why we're, we're figuring our, out our path here. Um, but this is uh, all amazing stuff. This stuff, I, I was working at um, on the Lucasfilm campus because I was at Lucasfilm animation and they've got um, all of these models sort of in the halls on the stairwells and all that kind of stuff. And you can kind of like they're they're in glass cases, but you can really go up to them, and it's incredible the amount of detail and craftsmanship that they use is is amazing. But the the other funny thing is kind of when you're building the stuff and you're going to be painting over it, um, you can kind of use anything. So you, you so when you really look up close on these models, um, you can see they're using like bottle caps, they're using like gum wrapper for foil. Like it, it's it's kind of hilarious. Like oh, that's an ice cream cone. Like you didn't like what what is this man? But uh, it's amazing because, like, it kind of, kind of requires you to look at things in a different way, break down shape and form, and kind of, you know, use that and and kind of see it in its final state. Um, but yeah, so this is like, if you like hands-on stuff, um, you know, this is a whole other direction you can take your career. And I will say, it's you know, this is a lot less common. Like, there's a lot fewer of these jobs. So you know, if this is the direction you want to go, you know, start with a solid base of just working in 2D, but then, you know, you kind of almost have to kind of have to be able to, to do this your, on your own and, and sort of find a community of, of uh, people who are into this kind of stuff because, you know, there's not a lot of schools that have a giant studio space that you can build a little city to do a, a stop mo set on. Um, but it is pretty freaking cool. Uh, let me just say that. Um, also in the middle of all this is um, Imagineering. So, uh, you know, theme park rides, that kind of stuff. Like if you've ever been to Disneyland, you know, all of those sets need to be imagined and built. Um, and like I, I know one guy who was a technical artist on one of our games and then he went to Lucas Animation and then he became an, an, an Imagineer. And that's, um, and he didn't do that to way late, like he was in his 50s by the time he finally did that. But that was the thing he always had wanted to do. It just took him a lot of time to sort of get to the point where he was ready for it. And once he did, he was in heaven. That was like his ultimate job. And like, we should all be so lucky. Um, yeah, so he went to Disney and he contributed to the uh, new Star Wars land at, at Disneyland. So that is pretty cool. So yeah, maybe this is something that you hadn't even considered, but you're like, whoa, this is pretty cool. Um, you can always start, you know, grab some Super Sculpey and start playing around with maquettes. Um, I've been pushing Idea Academy to get like maquette class workshop things because that's pretty cool. I would, I would take uh, one of those, uh, honestly, but it, that is very cool stuff if, if that is your jams. Um, so yeah, so some of the interesting things you can do in 3D in production art. Let's see, did I forget anything? Oh yeah, so there's a few more things. Um, there's, you know, if you, if you end up being good at color, there's a lot more technical kind of things that you can be doing as well. Uh, like lighting artists, you know, and that's going to be working in, in 3D sets, placing lights around um, and sort of a lighting artist is going to be working heavily with environment designs, but also color scripts and also working the, the storyboard shots. So there's, there's a lot of interaction there and the color grading and compositing, you know, you're going to be working in uh, After Effects and similar type of compositing software. And, you know, you might be working once again with, you know, let's just piggyback on that line there and this and just all over the place. You know, that's, uh, you know, Again, all of this relies very much on VizDev. So um, these are these are great little offshoots of of different careers that um, that you can actually do. Um, another one I forgot to put down here is um, 
effects art. So the two jobs that you can take if you never ever want to be out of work is effects artist or UI UX artist. Because there are some companies like Pixar, like if you're waiting for a concept artist job to sort of pop up on Pixar, you'll be waiting the rest of your life because they don't need concept artists. There's like a tidal wave of concept artists like at their gates at all time holding up signs that say please hire me like day and night like they have so many applicants they don't need to ever put a job posting for concept artists it's, it's just not something to do but they do sometimes put often say we need an effects artist immediately we will look at it and they don't care who you are they will get you and that's because it's it's a rare skill and I can only guess it's a highly technical kind of thing where you're working in um, packages like Nuke and compositors, um, maybe some After Effects kind of, you're dealing with particle effects, smoke, water, all of this kind of stuff, um, laser blasts, explosions, this kind of, and like everyone needs that. Games needs uh, effects, film, animation, all of that kind of stuff. And these are people who they can take like a six month vacation and when they get back, they can like lean out the window and they can say, hey, um, I, I do effects and I need some work. And they will have five answers immediately. So I don't know why exactly it is that it's so rare, probably because it's a pain in the butt. But if you, uh, if you value stability, I guess, like maybe that's something to look into. Um, and the other one is UI and UX, which we'll get to next in our final, final um, category here. So graphic design, who should be in graphic design? Well, you should be detail oriented. Uh, of course, you're dealing with fonts, you're dealing with like one pixel, like sort of kind of margins of error kind of thing because you're having to deal with different formats. You're look, it's, it's a highly, highly technical, precise position. And so that should be part of your soul if you're gonna be a graphic designer. Um, you're gonna want. Uh, you're gonna have longer deadlines because usually, um, like on games, that's kind of one of the very last things that happen. Um, in um, you know, in in film, which we're gonna talk about in a second, like that's you know, a lot of times you're doing physical stuff so that the prop department is getting that stuff out. You know, it kind of midway through production. Um, you know, people are going to be uh, you know scrutinizing this. They're going to be a, a bit of back and forth, but in the end. You know, graphic designers basically kind of are their own bosses. They're they're kind of dictating what looks good based on the genre and the trends and stuff like that. So mostly people stay out of their way. Um, but you know, th there will be a lot of opinions on like, oh, move that font there. Can we make it two pixels taller? That kind of stuff. Um, and of course, you'll be you know sort of using you know reference to you know in case you're trying to replicate a particular um, sort of style or time period or anything like that. Um, and so again, you know, this is keeping with our theme of like, what is the right thing for you? And it may not be the right thing for, like for me, this would be torture. Like I hate super precise stuff. Like it, they, I, at various times I've had to do it and I hated every moment of it and I hated myself. And I'm like, I'm never gonna do this again. But some people, um, it's, it's the perfect thing for them. Um, you know, so any game you've ever played, you know, they need a, a heads up display. They need some kind of counter for a life bar. They need messages and map items and, and a heads up, you know, kind of icons and stuff like that. Um, they even, you know, as a UI artist, you can actually go on some stores like Unity stores and you could sell your own packs of, um, you know, pre-done uh, UI. So like if you know how to wire this stuff, stuff up, you can kind of you know, do this on a freelance basis and just put your stuff in various stores and people will use it in their games. Um, you know, it doesn't, from the from the smallest mobile game to the fanciest, you know, League of Legends, you know, someone about what does that banner look like? What does this weird blue blob look like? You know, that, that's someone's full-time job there. So uh, if you've got a precise mindset, um, you know, that's the way to go. Uh, also localization, you know, translating everything into different fonts for different languages. That's a huge one. Um, and here's one I bet you sort of never thought of. Um, sort of gave you a hint about this earlier. So all of these 
are from uh, movies and um, as a matter of fact, really cool movies. Like, uh, so this is the work of Annie Atkins, who um, is another person who took kind of a weird path. They, she started, uh, I think she sort of went to an art school in London and then immediately got sort of stuck doing marketing art for a travel company in Iceland and she hated it. So she kind of came back and started going in a sort of different direction and she realized what she really liked was the graphic art part. But she also liked graphic design from different styles and times and stuff. And so she managed to get on to small productions uh, for just, you know, the amount, if you think about any movie or TV or, or project in general, um, there's probably some graphic design, there's product design, there's stuff in the scene that someone has to make up because it's usually going to be fake. So some of you may recognize some of the stuff from a little bit of Wes Anderson, a little bit of Leica, and like she's got, I believe she did um, Penny Dreadful, like all, all of their graphic design was her as well. Uh, but just, yeah, it, everything from like a telegram that needs to be sort of sorted out um, typefaces for signs, all of that kind of stuff. And for her, like this, this is, this is where she belonged. Um, and like so much so that she's giving classes in it because this is something that there's not, it's a small community of graphic designers that, um, that specialize in movie props. And like, who would, who would ever think that this would be sort of, you know, a, a, a career path that you could pursue. Um, but um, I, I love this story because it's just so quirky and weird. And, you know, if there, even though I hate graphic design, like if there was a way, if you told me like, oh, you could work with Wes Anderson and you could work with Leica, but the, the cost is you've got to do graphic design, I might consider it because that is pretty cool because those are some of my uh, favorite projects. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually, a, you know, once again, uh, a great story and maybe a good a good note to end on here, which is that, you know, I've tried to give you examples of, you know, a lot of artists who have sort of taken their own path and kind of found their own little niche in, in the sort of art world here. And I, I hope that's something you can take away from all of this. Um, and so, yeah, so that concludes the, the sort of boring blah, blah, blah part of this whole deal. Um, so maybe what I'll do is let's take five minutes and for any of you who have questions, like now's the time. Um, and, um, let's see, I just, you know, you know, this is a free, free class. So here's your chance to ask the stuff that you might be required to pay in another circumstances. So career stuff, um, craft stuff, uh, you know, remote working, um, you know, portfolio stuff, you know, anything you can think of, now's the time. And um, I'll, I'll give it a little bit. I'll give my voice a chance to rest and then we'll come back and maybe we'll, we'll do half an hour if, uh, if Paolo can, can figure that. Um, so yeah, if that sounds good. I'm gonna turn off my mic and camera and let's come back at like, let's say, I don't know, Five after, if that sounds good. Um, yeah. Sounds good. Excellent. Thank you much, Paolo. All right, guys. I'll see you in a second. All right. So give, give me some good questions. I, I want to hear stuff that I've never heard before. And and if if there's a lot of questions and if we run out of time, we can find some way to extend this on a, I don't know, uh, over email or something like that. But um, yeah. All right. So I'll see you in a few minutes. See you. So, guys, I guess we're going to meet back in five minutes, obviously. Uh, we're all going to be in the call. I'm not going to terminate it. Okay, so write all your questions and uh, we're going to go through them.
Alrighty. I am back. Let me, let's see. Put these questions up. Um, so let's see, how do we want to do this? Um, I want think to... we can go in uh, order. I think we had the very first question while you were doing the talk, actually. Uh, All right. Let me find it. Uh, one second. I think it was. Yeah, the first one was from uh, Anibal. Uh, who asked if uh, visual development takes in consideration problems that could come up later in the pipeline? Um, uh, yes, uh, is the short answer. And it depends on what you're working on. Uh, so for kind of the example I gave with games, that is where you'll find it probably the most. Although in animation, you know, when I was in Clone Wars uh, and Bad Batch, um, season two coming out, something like this fall was like a lot of rules of stuff that we it was really difficult to do like even though there's capes everywhere in star wars like we couldn't have capes on anyone unless it was someone who already had a cape in the movie like you know if, if darth vader was making an appearance which he wouldn't in bad batch but someone else i can't think of who would have a cape but then they were allowed to have a cape because if you think of animating a cape in 3D, you kind of need a rig that has all these extra bones to make the claw, or you're doing a claw sim, but like it, it's just a very expensive thing to render and all that kind of stuff. So the rule is no capes, no like loose, flowy clothing. Like, you know, if you had a flag, it had to be pinned down on three sides so it could only flap like this kind of stuff. So sometimes you know that ahead of time, which is obviously um, preferable. Sometimes you get surprised and you design someone with a cape and they're like, yeah, no capes, do, do it again. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's good to know sort of that there are technical limitations, but sometimes you know to get the best results, some places like to just go blue sky, do whatever, whatever you want, and we'll rein it in, you know, afterwards because that's a little easier than trying to work within a little box and making it good, you know, in in reverse. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that answers the question. But very good question. All right, what else have we got? Okay, uh, then always Anibal. He later asked uh, if it's possible to be both a generalist and specialized on something at the same time, basically. Um, yes, and I know this because that's kind of been my career. Like, I, you know, at, at times, like, I'll just get stuck doing one thing, like, uh, just over and over again. And, um, you know, I might be going through a period where I'm doing nothing but key art. But then generally the rest of my work is something else. Or stylistically, that's another thing that you might get sort of stuck doing one thing and then another thing. And then as a result, your portfolio is all over the place, which isn't great. It, it, you know, you should have maybe just a couple of styles. Um, but I, I think it is possible. So like, I guess a generalist in the sense that you can do a lot of things, but maybe a specialist is that there's one or two things that you're really, really good at. And that's kind of what you're known for. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the artists that you, you know, your favorite artists on ArtStation, uh, sometimes, you know, you'll know them for their work on some sort of games, but then you'll see, or or films or whatever, you'll see the personal work com looks completely different. And, um, you know, maybe they'll do smaller projects in like a different style. And that's something that I find is really good for my sanity. If I'm working on a lot of photoreal stuff, then then I'll just like naturally, I like I'll, I will crave super stylistic and and you know colorful things because i'm working on like grim dark stuff you know all day long i want i want the change there so um i think there's a way to sort of split that difference but like i say um definitely always good to know how to do a bunch of stuff but try to be really good at just a you know a couple things and and that should get you through it okay yeah. next and one we have yeah. Tayden. uh do you have any advice on securing internships for artists without connections in formal art education? Um, sure, sure. I mean, in general, kind of by definition, most interns aren't going to have any connections. You're just starting out. You know, your your art school might sort of be the connection because if the art school has a good relationship with a company, and and this is very common. Um, 
you know, companies like, so I went to the school in Florida called Ringling and they had a good relationship with ILM and Lucas and, and that's kind of how I, you know, my friends got hired first and they were able to recommend me and that's kind of how we got that ball, ball rolling. Um, so sometimes, yeah, that can be a great connection. So, you know, I, I, Idea has a great relationship with um, many companies um, sort of in Europe. So that's, that's a good start. But uh, with that said, you absolutely, um, you know, most companies, they will just do a public posting for internships. Usually um, they're going to be in the summer um, or at least in the States. I don't know, maybe Europe is, is a little bit different, but, um, you know, they'll just put it on their, uh, on their sites. Uh, the other way to find um, internship opportunities is definitely, if you're not already on LinkedIn, go on LinkedIn. It doesn't matter if you don't have a professional um, career already. You can put student, you know, uh, viz dev student, art student, you know, anything like that. And follow the companies you like. Follow DreamWorks, follow Pixar, follow Disney, follow ILM, any of these places. And a lot of times they'll be like, all right, summer internship uh, applications are over get your applications into the site. And that's how you do it. And that's how a lot of people get on, not knowing anyone at all. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I guess the sad truth is that probably, you know, if, if you have a school or a connection that will, you know, sometimes help you get to the top of the stack. But in the end, the, the only thing that really matters is the work that you have. Um, and that will, and, and that, is going to be the determining factor. Um, there's an Idea uh, Academy student I'm working with right now. Um, he, uh, like his whole goal in life was to get into uh, CD Projekt Red and he knew people. So he was applying for that internship. His work was great. Even though he had people on the inside and got to the top, you know, however, uh, you know, top 10, top five or something, they just didn't quite have enough spots for him. And so he, he didn't quite get it. And like that, I, I know that can wreck you and you're all going to go through that at least once in your life. And just, just know that sometimes it's out of, it's out of our hands. Um, and, you know, sometimes it, it comes down to recruiting and HR, making a call on how many people they can take or who they can take. So you just kind of have to go for it. But the main thing is, uh, don't worry, worry less about the contacts, worry more about your art, and, and that's probably the best uh, recipe for success. So, okay. Yeah. Thank um, you for Anna is asking, uh, I'm a professional freelance illustrator, but I want to try myself in concept art and viz dev. I'm preparing a new portfolio, but it's really hard since I always over-render my concepts. So, so one simple drawing can take hours. Any advice on how to break this habit? Okay. Um, yeah. And this is not uncommon. Like I, I think I technically started as an illustrator as well. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of that process of, all right, I've got to loosen up. I've got to let go of stuff. So some of that's going to come from your end of just working quickly. So, you know, for me, the key was doing, you know, figure studies where it's like a five minute pose, a two minute pose, and just learning to let go of those details and, and that kind of stuff, and then bringing that into your more finished art. Um, and then basically trying to um, have the mindset of exploring. So like, uh, you know, as an illustrator, you might, you might have been called on to do a character in a scene um, as a finished illustration. But like, whether you know it or not, there was, uh, there was kind of a viz dev process happening and you just have to extract it out of that. So you kind of rewind the tape. You know, when you were deciding what that character looks like, sort of stop that moment in time. And instead of rendering out the whole character, give three or four versions of different costumes, different body types, different, you know, you know so you're giving options because that's what, that's what concept art and viz dev is all about, is sort of the stage that someone picks, all right, we're going with B, and then that becomes the illustration. So kind of take your, take your mind back there and perform that step that you were probably doing mentally, but kind of put that on paper or, you know, digital paper, pixels, and sort of let us see your, your thought process there. Uh, because it, it really, it, you know, VizDev is process. So, you know, just, um, it, it could be as simple as that, you know, you know doing variations of characters, props, uh, environments, and just showing, showing process 
iterations, different takes on stuff. Uh, I, I think that will be a good first step. And then just sort of switching your mentality, you know, as I showed in my, my goofy chart there of like, all right, we've got to have a, a rapid iteration mindset. We've got to think about, you know, the, the bigger picture for this kind of stuff and, and see how you like it. Um, because it might be that, that you hate it and maybe really what you need to do is channel your illustration art into like marketing or key art or, or something like that, you know. Um, but it definitely is worth a try. I mean, technically, you should try everything if you're going to live long enough. So, but yes, great question. Okay, moving on. Uh, Anneli uh, is asking. Uh, I'm starting my second year in October. I'm not sure what to focus on on my final portfolio, like TV animation or animated films, uh, uh, and also what area like uh, character design, prop design, color scripts, uh, and so on and so forth. Do you think I should decide? now so I can make a tailored portfolio for next year for when I apply to studios or should I make a general portfolio and apply with that? Um, I would say so you've got you're you're going to have a sort of full year to figure it out and I think where you end up at the end certainly uh, especially in your second year um, where you end up at the end of that is going to be very different from where you are now so whatever expectations you may think that you have you know, might not reflect who you are sort of at the end of this. So I, my recommendation is um, don't worry so much about the, the, the focus at the moment. Just try a lot of things, see, you know, see what you like and what you're good at. Because in the end, that's kind of how you, that's the basics of, of figuring out kind of the path, the direction you should take. It's like, all right, what, would, what, what interests me the most and what am I good at? And wherever those two sort of cross, that's a good place to start. Um, so if um, if you've not done a lot of this stuff before, then just sort of block all of this sort of career stuff out a little bit and just, just fo put all your energy into getting good. And then as the year is wrapping up and you've got this body of work, you can kind of see like, oh, I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, I, maybe I want to do a bit more of that. And, um, you know, then we can start you know, or, 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 you know, maybe it's halfway through the year so that you can start, you know, with the remaining time left, start to focus on that. But just, um, yeah, I would say for where you are right now, just focus on, on doing the stuff and um, yeah, give it some time and then start, start uh, tailoring your portfolio at, to, to when you start applying to studios. Um, and then two, uh, another thing about portfolios, um, just a side note here, uh, I'm since I've worked on a lot of different things, I've got a lot of different styles, and a lot of times that that works against you, um, because like I would, uh, you know, in my naivete, I thought that oh well, an art director can see, like it doesn't matter what style, right? If it's good art, they'll know and they'll say you're hired. That's not how anything works, apparently. So the, the way it works is if you are applying for a job that is a designer of unicorns, right? Like and this is like a movie about unicorns or something. And you have got um, a portfolio full of horses. And you're like, oh, I'm, this is, this is going to be perfect for me. I draw horses and it's really close to a unicorn. And you submit your portfolio. The answer you're going to get is like, I'm sorry. I need someone who's going to design unicorns. You only have horses. This is completely useless to me. Um, so um, that's the unfortunate reality is a lot of times people kind of want to see exactly and only what they're expecting. So what I learned to do is I kind of separated portfolios. So if I was applying for a character design job, uh, let's say it's heavily stylized, I've got a portfolio that is only that. And then um, if, I've, if I want to work on a, like a photo real AAA game, like Dead Space or something like that, uh, you know, I've got only that kind of stuff. And because uh, I guess in the end, you, know, you don't want to sort of waste the art director's time looking at stuff that doesn't apply to them. So that's the approach I'm taking. Um, there's other ways to do it, but like, um, but basically just sectioning off. If nothing else, like in in art station uh, or or other places, you can just have a folder full of only character work or only you know photo real work, that kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, that's getting a little sidetracked. So uh, Annalie, just keep doing what you're doing and uh, keep in contact with me because um, we will we can figure out your your stuff once you get more work if that makes sense, hopefully. Okay. But uh, thank you for the question and thank you for showing up. And 
Yeah, and uh, at the end of this, I'm going to put my I'll, I'll put my email down, and, and if anyone's got follow up questions, you can you can definitely contact me. Sorry, please go ahead, Paolo. Okay, uh, Serene, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, is uh, asking uh, how can we make our portfolio stand out and get noticed by studios more easily? Should we focus on concepts, technical skills, networking, or anything else? Um. So yes, that is absolutely correct, Serene. Um, there is a huge competition for uh, just about ev everything. And uh, so, but there's a couple of things um, working in your favor. Um, so like remote work is opening, uh, like I, I forget if you mentioned where you were from, but you know, uh, up to this time, I've been working with you know, students in, in the schools that I teach throughout Europe. And it's very difficult if you're in a town where, where there's no work. And so you basically had to travel there and then it gets to, oh, well, you got to speak the language or you got to afford like living in Paris or something like that. You know, re remote work is opening up a huge amount of possibility, but then that also kind of backfires because that means more people are in competition for the work as well. Um, but to, to answer your question, standing out, um, I think, my philosophy is basically to stand out um your work should be as unique to you and as specific to you as possible and be uh, because that will i think in the end that's really i mean okay so there's some people who are geniuses and like they sort of are born into this world and they've got this amazing style already and everyone loves their style and they're set for life and that's great it's like all right i'm done I am not one of the, I was never one of those people. I had to find my style and it took a long time. Um, and so I sort of bounced around. Um, and so, so some of you might have this sort of preordained style and stuff that's going to get you noticed right away. But for those of you who don't, um, the, the way to stand out is by sort of putting as much of yourself into the art as you can. So, you know, if, if there is a subject, if there is, um, you know, even a color palette, just anything that you love and are passionate about and and forces you to spend extra time because you love it so much, that's what you should focus on. Like, you know, if you love like frogs or something and like all your artwork is crazy frogs and different kind of things, then, you know, you know, that it's kind of a double-edged sword because anyone who doesn't need frogs is not going to call you. But that one production who's like, oh my God, we're doing an, an animated movie about frogs. This is perfect that's going to get you sort of that job. That comes back to general versus specific again, but um, in a broader sense, you know, your taste is going, to make, is going to make you stand out. So like, you know, as I said, you know, color palettes, you know, your, your treatment of, of, you know, the, the media, whether it's, you know, your line work, that kind of stuff, just, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I guess basically just finding what makes you unique is is going to help quite a bit. Um, and, and that's like, honestly, that's sort of the generic answer that you're going to kind of hear from anywhere. Um, I guess the, the more specific answer, honestly, these days is uh, sort of be pretty hardcore about targeting where it is you're applying. Like if you are applying at let's say you're applying for Tonko House, right? You know what the Tonko House style is. Make all your work kind of look like that, basically, if that makes sense. So you want to make it so easy for the art director to say, oh, this looks like exactly what I need. Uh, we could put her into the pipeline and it, and it won't be an issue at all. You know, So make it easy for someone to hire you. Do your research on who you're, you're applying to and you know, since you can't make a new portfolio for every place you apply to, it's it's good to have like sort of a scope. You know, if you're applying to Pixar and DreamWorks, basically you can use the same portfolio for both of those if you can kind of get that style to be, you know, if you can get your work close to that style. Um, so that's the much more actionable thing I think you can do to make yourself stand out is like research who you're applying for, try to get your work and and subject matter. Uh, keep in mind. So like, if you want to go to C CD Projekt Red, you know what they're interested in, right? You, they're interested in like, uh, you know, like fantasy stuff and cyberpunk dudes with stuff coming out of their heads. So like, that's what you should have in your portfolio. And I think these days, that's what's, you know, um, a lot of people these days, I used to tell people never do fan art. Like that's, 
That's so amateur. That's like embarrassing. But people are getting hired doing fan art. Like, uh, like these guys. Like, oh, I, I'm I'm doing uh, you know Transformer fan art. Like, you're hired, says ILM. Uh, it's incredible. So, like, if you prove that you really love a franchise, you know, if you if you want to work on uh, Transformers and Ninja Turtles, you better have some of that in there because it shows that you you love the the franchise and you you respect the IP and you know it inside and out. Like uh, a lot of people get hired at ILM and Lucasfilm uh, based on their Star Wars uh, fan art in the portfolio. So it sounds crazy. And uh, a few years ago, that might not have been good advice, but it seems like it's the way to go here. Um, so I just gave you like a lot of weird advice. So hopefully one of those makes enough sense to you that you can be actionable about. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Marina is asking if you have any, I guess, general advice for vstev portfolios um i guess basically uh for vstev portfolios if you're just starting out the main thing is uh it really just really really helps everything if you can draw and paint well so like if you you should know your anatomy really well you should know your um you know color fairly well that kind of stuff you know perspective is great if you if you can do 3d at all that's super helpful for vstev these days it used to be you could get by almost any job in VizDev just knowing Photoshop, but like these days you will be a rock star if you can, like if someone needs like, oh, I need a futuristic city. And, you know, imagine someone sort of painting that all out and at the end of it, you've got like one view of it. But if you build it in Blender or Maya, you've got like, you've got 10 views in your portfolio. You've got a pulled out view, you've got a street view, you've got an overhead view all of this kind of stuff, and that's super useful. Um, so yeah, so basically fundamentals, number one. Number two, um, knowing software packages, especially 3D. Um, and, and then the third one is just, I, I guess, basically uh, get good at, at sort of problem solving visually, you know, uh, because in some sense, like technically speaking, a good concept it doesn't matter how how well it's drawn. Like if I if I drew, like if there was no Star Wars and I drew a picture of Chewbacca on a napkin and it was a good design, someone could look at that and go, "Ooh, that's a really cool creature design." And it it could be like a little kid scribble, right? So, um, of course, that's unfortunately you know the the industry's gotten a little bit more advanced and you couldn't do that these days. But the concept is that the idea is as important as the art. You know, the the concept is as important as the art. So um to that end i would say you know watch a lot or you know consume a lot of the media that you want to be in you know it's movies comics that kind of stuff absorb what is out there uh and and kind of decide for yourself like what makes something good what makes something bad what do i like personally um and you know how would i improve this you know if you see sometimes like a crappy design like how would i make this better that kind of think along that lines all the time um and uh then try to take that into your work. So yeah, I, there's, there's three easy to do avenues for you to get into VizDev, um, which all will take years and years of your life, but uh, maybe something to keep in mind. But uh, yeah, thank you, Maria. Okay. Uh, I don't think we're going to have time to go through all the questions, but I was uh, scanning through them and I noticed that there's like three questions that are all on one topic. So I think that basically we can maybe explore the topic. So uh, it would be helpful for several people. Basically, uh, there are many people, obviously, who may be located in one part of the world and would like to work for a company that is located in another part of the world like uh, Asia and they want to work for Pixar or Europe and they want to work for, I don't know, ILM or stuff like that. So um, there are several questions in regards to uh, do you what do you think the landscape uh, in regards to this is? Uh, do you think is it might be a problem during an interview if it comes up and I'm in a different continent uh, or uh, do you think uh, this may create problems or is it a good, uh, how, how is this going to hold up basically now and in the near future, stuff like that? Okay. Um, yes. So, so there's good and bad news. So as I mentioned before, remote work is, is causing a lot of things to open up. For example, I am in fabulous, uh, well, just north of San Francisco here. 
Um, and but my studio that I work for is in Burbank, California, which is just like 500 miles south of me uh, in LA, basically. And this is only possible through the miracle of Zoom and remote work. Uh, and that would never have been possible in a million years before because there's a lot of resistance to remote work. So the first thing is that is opening up some possibilities. There are companies that are coming out now that are completely remote. Um, one uh, game company that uh, Idea knows very well is uh, Mountaintop Studios, who uh, Andrea works for, and they are a 100% remote video game company. They don't care where you work. He's in Italy. I think their their corporation is is based in in California or something. They don't care. They've figured out a way to make it work. So that is a great opportunity. Uh, and nowadays, I see a lot of places um, listing like remote uh, possible or something like that. So once again, LinkedIn, you know, check those job listings. You know, you can talk to a recruiter and say, hey, would you consider remote? That kind of thing. And sometimes they didn't know they would consider remote until they saw your portfolio. And they'll be like, hmm, maybe we're going to consider remote. Um, apart from that, uh, you know, traditionally working uh, internationally has always been an issue because it's a because most of the time you need a work visa to go, you know, work out of uh, out of the country that you're in. and so the company has to pay for that and they have to do the paperwork for that. And they kind of have to prove, at least in the U.S., I, I assume it's a, it's a similar system in other places, but they kind of have to approve that, oh, um, we can only hire this position by filling it with this person from Asia because there's no one in the United States who can quite do this. this. So it's this kind of whole like process kind of thing. And a lot of times companies aren't necessarily crazy about that. And it, and it just makes paperwork a little bit uh, weird too. Um, so, and, and that hasn't changed. Uh, it, if, if anything, it's getting harder these days. Um, but just with more studios in general, I think it's possible that, you know, just with the technology and all this kind of stuff, some companies are getting to be a bit more open to that. Um, but regardless, for those of you who are, in various countries and want to go work in another country, I would say the best way to start that process going, uh, get on LinkedIn, find a, you know, follow the company that you want to go to, uh, find a way to link in with a recruiter and just start that conversation going. It's like, hey, do you ever, do you have any international staff, you know, in your art department? Um, you know, is there, you know, I, I, you, and you can say like, I'm an art student, but I just want to know this kind of thing it's you know some recruiters will ignore you some the good ones will will have something to say and start a relationship um and that's that's what you want to do you want to have a name you can pull up so that when you are ready with your portfolio and you know they've got an internship or they've got a junior position you can kind of go here mr or mrs recruiter uh here's my portfolio do you think this will work and and hopefully they've been talking to you the whole time and they'll be like sure i'm, I'm happy to pass it along um, so yeah, there, there are challenges. It, it is done. I know plenty of international people that are in the industry. I, uh, when I was an art director at a uh, game studio, I hired, I preferred international people, honestly. Um, and it's worked out great. And they've, they've stayed in California and had amazing careers. So it, it is definitely doable, but it's just that extra step that sometimes will um, make you slightly less desirable as a candidate um, than, than other candidates. So it's just a challenge you'll have to work with. Um, and I guess the easy answer is move to where you want to work, become a citizen, marry somebody, I guess. And, uh, you know, that'll make it a lot easier. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that kind of touches on, on all of those sort of questions uh, wrapped into one. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. So, yeah, we're, we're getting to uh, 11 30. Yeah, I, th I think we can do another question. Uh, I think, I don't know, maybe we can go in order. Uh, Cookie was asking uh, if, basically, apart from LinkedIn, there's any other uh, resources, websites, uh, or uh, that you would recommend people to, you know, get noticed or uh, help them to get a foothold in the industry? Okay, um, let's see. Well, I guess I mean, from I was, Art Station, of course. <laughs> right, I was going to say Art Station is a good one. And, you know, people get, you know, I've gotten many inquiries, just someone liked my work on the portfolio, and they were like, hey, we are doing this. Usually, unfortunately, these days, most of the inquiries are like, we are starting an NFT project, and like, delete, delete. 
you know, that's you know, your mileage may vary, but those projects generally tend to not end up well. So I would recommend against that. Um, and a lot of times those are kind of spam, scam kind of things. Um, but yes, like, uh, you know, you sort of play at your own risk, I guess. Um, so yeah, LinkedIn and ArtStation are the big ones. You know, um, just getting your work up on Instagram. I know a lot of people, that's their only source of portfolio. Um, and that's where, you know, people find them because, you know, art directors search on Instagram and they're like, hey, this is great. Um, I don't do that. I've got like 12 people on my Instagram. So like, obviously that was not my path to success, but depending on your art style, depending on your, um, you know, the genre or, you know, or what medium you're working in, you know, that might be the perfect spot for you. Um, there used to be a lot more online um, art sort of community type things, and that has become less and less these days. Um, there are certain Discord channels where the, where, you know, sort of people get together and, and do that kind of thing uh, and sort of network. But so these days, the in-person stuff, now that like live events are going on these days a bit more, uh, those are a great resource. So we talked about the sort of publishing fairs. You know, there's Annecy actually coming up very soon, um, which is a little more animation um, focused or very animation focused, I suppose. So like if, if that is direction you should go, you know, that's a great way to just meet people, hear talks. Um, you know, if, if there's comic cons uh, in your area, that's, you know, usually publishers are there. Sometimes they'll do portfolio uh, reviews there. So that's another great way to sort of see who's in the biz, talk to someone. And that's great because it's face to face. Like the recruiters still value that the most. So definitely take advantage of any kind of um, sort of live events. So there's GDC uh, and I know there's, I think there's GDCs on just about every continent. Like there's a GDC Europe. I think there's a GDC maybe several in Asia. Um, so that's a great one if, you know, for games, obviously. Um, and like, yeah, Comic Cons is a little bit of, of everything else. Um, and, you know, probably I Idea Academy can, can help you a little bit more with career stuff. Um, and honestly, some of it is your peers in, the, uh, in, in a school, uh, basically. So like the people sitting around you in class today are gonna be, you know, your contacts inside of places tomorrow, you know, and they may be your coworkers. So, you know, I would start right away with that kind of, you know, that kind of stuff as well. So yeah, just, uh, you know, finding social media, that kind of stuff. Uh, one thing for game people, there's a site by a guy I know called uh, gamedev.com, and which you may know about. Let's see, I'll type it in here, gamedevmap.com. And this just shows every single um, company in the world or, or just about, basically. Um, and so that's great because you might not know that there's like five companies in your backyard. And they might be smaller companies or they might be new or, or something like that. Um, so that's worth checking out if you're into games. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of at the moment. But uh, that that should give you some avenues to explore at least. And I, I don't know, Paolo, if, you, if you've got um, any other suggestions. Certainly the no, I the think you covered it. Uh, you covered pretty much everything. Like you said, like mostly it's... Uh recruiters they're either on linkedin or our station or mo both generally yeah. speaking so that's where you get the organic uh, uh messages where people might be giving you offers or uh want to contact you directly to schedule uh you know an interview or something like that and then apart from that uh, like you were saying it's either a question or contacts you know uh i know somebody who told me that there's going to be an opening in this certain uh, company, but there's nothing out yet, or it's a question of um, you know doing the doing the groundwork and going through lists uh, like uh, game dev maps, and uh, you know there's also I believe there's also some uh, Google Docs uh, shared uh, by communities of uh, animators, modelers, uh, visual development artists, where they have like uh, openings and uh, information and they're like uh, updated by the communities and stuff like that. But uh, that's pr pretty much like, I, I think like you said before, uh, at this stage, probably when you're a student, uh, uh, the, the most important thing you should fo be focusing on is the skill. 
uh, then finding lists of companies to apply to is not going to be um, a particularly diff a difficult thing to do, generally speaking. I, although it is important to keep uh, have a, an online uh, presence, basically, you know, uh, have like a little um, what you call a little space that allows people who actively look for resources such as yourself to see you in the first place. But uh, apart from that. Uh, uh, I cannot think of anything else, basically. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, there we have it. Um, so, like, I, I'm seeing a lot of really good questions um, here, and I don't want to miss any of them. So, Pablo, is it possible to, like, grab these, um, and then I can follow up with an email or something, and you can get it out to the people? Because, like, there's some really, really good things sure. that sure. maybe I people think should so. hear about. I don't want to miss it. Um, cool. So, yeah, don't worry. Uh, if you ask a question, I will get to it. Uh, might take a week or so, but I'll get it back to Paolo and he can kind of put it up somewhere. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll also just put my, uh, my email in the chat. If anyone has got further questions, you know, give me a, give me a ring and we can chat it out. Um, yeah, no, uh, thank you all. Um, it, I, I hope it was useful. Um, sorry about having, uh, next time I'll have some background music or something to, to break up the sound of me droning on, but um, hopefully you got some useful information of all uh, out of all of that. And uh, and you know it's great that it's going to be recorded for people who couldn't make it. Um, so that's all good too. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming. It was it was it was amazing to, to be able to chat with you and and meet you thank all you, all actually, over the world. Thank oh, you very much for uh, yeah. you know lending us thank your you. time. You're a very busy person. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, it's true, but it's it's my pleasure. I, I hope to get back to more teaching soon, and, and hopefully some of it at the academy, uh, potentially someday. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I enjoy it. Like, and I mean, this isn't just a commercial, because they're like academy really is a great school. I've taught in a lot of schools. They do a really good job. They really care about their students. So if you're at all thinking about it, you know, it it's a, it's a pretty low risk thing to take a couple classes and see if it's for you, whether it's online or in person if you happen to be uh, in the Rome area. Um, so yeah, I, I can't recommend them enough. It's one of my favorite places to teach. And hopefully someday when this world stops being so horrible, I can come back there in person. Come back and and <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, that would be <laughs> awesome to have you. I think we haven't seen each other in person in like, I don't know, five years or some, four We've years or something so like much. that. Yeah, it's it aged great. us all, I'm all yeah, like. <laughs> a blur. Mm. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Yes, uh, I, I see everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you so much. Great weekend to you all. Um, and, and feel free to reach out when you're ready to. Okay. Bye, everyone. All Bye, right. Jim. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.